From KPU News in Austin, you're watching Texas This Week with Ashley Goodo. Good Sunday morning. President Donald Trump visited Austin this week to tout the strength of the American economy. Let's get right to the three things you need to know in Texas politics. The president arrived in Austin Wednesday afternoon and was greeted by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Attorney General Ken Paxton. He headed to Northwest Austin to tour the Flextronics facility with Apple CEO Tim Cook. That's where employees manufacture Apple's Mac Pro computers, something that was at risk of ending two months ago because of America's ongoing trade war with China and subsequent tariffs. The White House exempted Apple from those tariffs, so production will remain in Austin. President Trump said while he was on the campaign trail, he envisioned Apple opening more plants in America, and now that's happening. Proof, he says, that America has the strongest economy in the world. On the same day as the president's visit, 10 of the Democratic presidential candidates debated in Atlanta. They sparred over race relations, foreign policy, and experience. Texan and former HUD Secretary Julian Castro was one of the seven candidates who didn't make the cut to be on stage, but he's still confident he can win. He traveled to Atlanta to meet with community members and speak with political commentator Angela Rye. Candidates have two weeks left to file to have their names on the ballot for the Texas primary. And while he hasn't officially declared his candidacy, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has filed to run for president in Texas. The Texas primary election is a little more than three months away, and a familiar face is among the 10 Democrats running to challenge U.S. Senator John Cornyn, combat veteran M.J. Hagar. She previously ran for Congress and was narrowly defeated by the incumbent. We sat down to discuss why her sights are now set on the Senate. For people who may not be familiar with you and your story, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for the U.S. Senate. So I grew up here. I went to Leander High School in uh, North Austin. Um, and, you know, I joined the military. I love this country. I kind of wanted to be Han Solo. I had a bit of an adrenaline addiction and um, wanted to be a combat pilot, which was a really difficult path. Um, but I became one. I became a medevac helicopter pilot and did three, terms in, uh, three tours in Afghanistan. And then, um, you know, when I got out of the military, I partnered with uh, an organization to try to open jobs for women up for competition in the military and uh, the Joint Chiefs unanimously sided with us and we were able to go to DC and build a broad coalition on the right and left about you know making our military stronger and making retention better and recruiting better and um, you know I learned a lot about how DC worked and as somebody who put on the uniform and bled for our Constitution I was shot down in my third tour in Afghanistan it really kind of turned my stomach how DC works and how many corporate special interests and the influence of money and you know the lack of servant leaders not that there aren't any but there aren't many um, and I, I noticed especially with my representatives that they were more interested in self-preservation and getting reelected and getting campaign donations than they were in legislating for us and for the people who they represent so um, I'm running for Senate now because I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I believe our Constitution is under a domestic threat now. And I believe that we deserve better from our representatives. In 2018, you ran for office in a historically red district against Congressman John Carter. Um, while you were not successful in that campaign, you came very close. Why not run for Congress again, or excuse me, you know, the House? Yeah. Why go for the Senate? Um, plenty of people have pointed out to me that would be easier. I, I often say, have you met me? I never take the easy road. <laughs> um, you know, I believe that it's important that we unseat John Carter as well still. I do think that that's still important. But I thought that the urgency was in getting Democrats control of the House. And I do feel like we helped with that. And we showed that that seat is not uh, irretrievably you know, impossible to win. There's plenty of people running for it now. Um, two of the state uh, you know, House seats in that district we helped flip. We ran coordinated campaigns with them. Um, and I, I don't want to say that it's not urgent that we unseat John Carter, but I didn't see that I, it had to be me. I didn't see... I, I saw that it was very possible for someone else to unseat him. Um, and as somebody who has flown, you know, water missions to suppress wildfires, it's kind of in my nature to find the biggest bucket of water I can find and put out the biggest fire that I can find. I believe that 
I'm in a position to unseat John Cornyn, who is one of our U.S. senators, and that he is absolutely really bad for Texas and not working for Texan families. Let's talk about some of the issues facing Texans. As you are well aware, this is the state with the highest rate of uninsured uh, residents. And you know, children. Yeah, and yeah. children. I mean, we just don't. It's so embarrassing. It, tell yeah. me how you want to begin to address this. Well, there's so much that we can do and so much that we should do. And so many of the decisions that are impacting this and that are causing kids to be uninsured and people to be uninsured in Texas are being made because of partisanship, which just turns my stomach. All right. I would like everybody in Texas um, to have access to be able to be uh, covered by Medicare. I think that all children should automatically qualify for Medicare, and that would take care of our, you know, children that are uninsured issue. Um, and I think that we need to have a public option. Uh, we need to have Medicare available for everybody because I am also cognizant of, you know, protecting individual liberties and freedoms. That's something that's very important to Texas. Um, and growing up in Texas, I know that we are a country and a state of choices and freedoms. So I think that we need to have people with the option to, you know, take the what I consider far superior product of Medicare, um, but I think that we should maintain the option for them to stay on private insurance should they choose to. You know, obviously Texas was home to some tragic shootings. We had exactly. El Paso, we had Odessa, and there is always this conversation when these things happen about what can we do to prevent these types of things from happening. Yeah. What are your ideas on There's that? There's so much we need to do, and John Cornyn cashed an, an NRA check two weeks after the El Paso shooting, a few days after the Midland Odessa shooting, our Republican senators, all of them, well, I don't know if anybody was absent from that meeting, but a group of Republican senators went into a room to talk specifically about gun violence. We had two senators from Texas in that room. When they came out, they were asked, where did you land on background checks? And they said it didn't come up. Three days, three or four days after a shooting that happened that a universal background check would have stopped because the shooter failed a background check and then went to a private sale where he didn't need a background check to obtain his weapon. So there's so much that needs to be done. Um, I mentioned anti-trafficking. Um, we absolutely have to sale, end the sale of weapons of war to the public. Um, I have used these weapons for their intended purpose in combat. As a combat veteran, I feel like I need a place at this table and we need more responsible gun owners and people that understand these weapons at the table to have these conversations. Um, I understand the damage that they can do. I understand their intended purpose and they should not be in the hands of civilians. Um, we need to obviously have universal background checks for every type of firearm sale. Um, we need to fully fund the CDC to research the impact and the, 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 the things that we can do to reduce violence not only in technology but in policy. There's just so much that we need to do. Um, I've called broadly for an end to open carry as a responsible gun owner myself but also as a mom I don't understand the need for open carry it does not infringe on our second amendment rights to not be allowed to walk around pecan street festival with an automatic rifle strapped to your chest when I saw that happening this last pecan street festival I had to pack my kids up and leave you know what about our rights that's an assault on bystanders and makes us feel unsafe and makes us not able to see something, say something, and get help from law enforcement. So there's a lot that needs to be done. None of it can be done while we have our current representatives in office. And now the last word. This has been a week for the history books. No, seriously. The fact that America is holding impeachment hearings for the leader of the free world is historic. These hearings are something we've only done four times in our nation's 243 year history. When the founding fathers were constructing the Constitution, they had a very real, very valid fear that the democracy they were working so hard to build could one day revert back to tyranny. The fear that one man, and yes, I say man because back then they were only thinking about male leaders, but that a man elected by the people could become so unruly, unreasonable, and unchecked that he would threaten our great democracy. And there were two things in particular a president could do in their eyes to warn impeachment, treason and bribery. Now, I'm not here to give you my opinion on these current impeachment hearings, but I will ask you to consider the seriousness of what's happening. I will ask you to pay attention to what's being said to get information on these hearings from fair journalists, not ones who pander to one side or the other. And I will ask you to replace your partisan politics with patriotism. You're not a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, or a Libertarian. You're an American. 
first and always. And your opinion on this matters. It matters in what you say, what you post, and how you vote. That's the last word. And this has been Texas This Week.